Good morning, everybody. My name's Steve Bates. I'm the Chief Executive of the BIA, uh, and welcome to this COVID-19 update, what, what the UK life science sector are doing and how you can support. Uh, this is a, another in the series of webinars we're doing for our community, and I'm delighted to be joined by uh, Michael Warren, my colleague Michael Warren, who's going to uh, MC and compare this one. And uh, uh, we've got some great guests in Jane Osborne and Ian McCubbin who are going to give updates uh, on their areas. Um, I'm afraid I have to start with some sad news. Uh, and that's that uh, a colleague that's well known to us, uh, Michael Wakelam of Abraham, unfortunately uh, died of uh, 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 having uh, COVID uh, this week. He's well known to many of us in the community and is sorely missed. Um, uh, and condolences go to, to him and, uh, and colleagues who work with him. This week, we're going to have a quick look at an um, update from uh, what, what's going on from government support. Many people are interested in how that's working. Then I'm going to sort of go into uh, what's been happening this week, uh, much of which has been on, on the news, uh, then how us as a sector uh, are responding. And then we'll get into the meat of this, which is, I think, uh, you, you may be aware of some uh, task forces that the BIA has established. And uh, Jane and Ian will be able to give uh, live updates as to where those have got to. And then if you're interested in getting involved or having questions or comments, that's how we'll look to do it. We'll try and do this in 45 minutes uh, and we promise to finish before the top of the hour. Michael, over to you. Thanks, Steve. Morning, everybody. Um, so uh, hopefully everyone can see you and me, Steve. Uh, innovation this week is webcams. Um, so uh, I don't know, hopefully it'll, uh, you, know, you can put a face to the name uh, now and the voice. Um, so Steve just said uh, a lot to get through. Um, it's going to be a great session, I think. We're going to try and keep it interactive as we did last week. So uh, I'm going to put questions um, and comments to Steve, and Steve's going to take us through a good chunk of content update this week. Uh, and then we're going to do Q&A format for the updates from Ian and Jane. Uh, but we also want to hear from you as the audience as well. So do please start right now putting your comments and questions into the questions box on the control panel. Uh, and I'll be looking at those. You might see me looking down a bit as we go through. Uh, I'll be looking at those as we go through the webinar live and pulling out the comments and questions and putting them to Steve and our guests as well, uh, just to make it feel a bit more interactive. So do please do that. Get ready to answer our polls. We've got four lined up. Uh, and uh, if you're on social media, uh, we're also uh, live tweeting on the webinar this week. So use the hashtag BIA webinar. OK, hopefully that sounds OK. Get your questions coming in, please. Right. So, Steve, we're going to start with uh, an update on what's new in terms of government support this week. It's only seven days since our last webinar, uh, but quite a few things have moved. You just want to take us through these quickly. So a quick update on government action to date. Uh, so first of all, in terms of the support schemes. Now, we've seen a couple of new measures introduced, haven't we, in relation to the things industry have been feeding back on? Yeah, so I think um, you can see that uh, a great summary here of the uh, of the, the core bits that we've been we've been asking for. I think there's uh, further details coming out around, particularly around the corona, uh, sorry, the coronavirus job retention scheme, um, uh, how the the, the self-employed stuff is working, how the loans uh, that may be offered uh, are now uh, no personal guarantees will be taken as security. These are almost happening an hour by hour basis. Uh, and we're trying to make sure that we're putting the uh, full details of these into um, into our website. Uh, uh, and uh, and here's the link for the for the government one. Uh, I'm I'm aware that there are many things that uh, aren't working successfully for our sector, and we're continuing to make representations uh, day to day uh, to the Treasury about what what's needed. Yeah, a couple of specifics I put on the slide here. The first one is um, waiving of import duties. I don't know what sort of impact you think that's likely to have. So 12% duties on things like ventilators, testing kits, PPE, uh, and then secondly, the flexibility on annual leave allowances was something that I think we picked up on as well. Yeah, so I think the, the first one's obviously welcome, but I think we, we're aware that there are tight supply chains uh, globally on many of these things. So uh, I think probably um, the, the challenge will be getting hold of the bits rather than, uh, in a sense, the tax position. Uh, the second one, I think, is um, uh, is uh, is good flexibility and help, or maybe something if people are running companies, they need to to think about and think about with their staff that's uh, come up this week. Yeah, good stuff. Okay, uh, but we know that the package isn't perfect, uh, and there's been some criticism of it from across industry, um, and the government have now put in a couple of responses to that. So let's just talk through those quickly. Um, 
So, I mean, it's interesting that the government itself started criticising the banks this week about the way they were operating the loan scheme. Um, and then the Chancellor just overnight has put out an announcement about changes to that. Uh, now, we weren't sure about the loan scheme in terms of our sector, were we? No, I mean, as you know, we, we have many companies for whom um, in normal times, banks don't don't seem to want to, to lend against IP back, backed companies. So uh, we've uh, Martin has done a, a great job here, and I'm not sure if Martin's with us, but uh, I know he's got he's he's been. Uh, it, I think he's actually uh, on a webinar with the British Business Bank as we speak. Yeah, so um, he is uh, fighting the fight for for our sector around many of the inputs that people have brought in. And again, I think you can see that there's a, there's a real time endeavour to 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 make this work uh, practically. We are um, uh, taking your your voice to to whether it be the British Business Bank, whether it be the Treasury. And we're fighting for this to be something that works for, for, for you. We're conscious that many of it isn't working for you. Keep, keep feeding into us, please. And we'll do more on this uh, next week with Martin joining us. OK, good stuff. And then there's been a bit of uh, movement on regulatory processes as well. So we've seen guidance from MHRA on flexibility in relation to starting and stopping trials and supply of IMPs. Uh, HRA have done stuff as well. And, uh, and I think uh, EMA I've put out guidance as well, which we've linked to on the micro site. I mean, all of this is pretty welcome, isn't it? Yeah, and I think it's on the on the website. Have a look if it's of use to you. Please stay up to date with it. Um, it is moving on a sort of daily basis as well. Yeah, good stuff. All right. Um, okay, first poll. Uh, talk us through it, Steve. So oh, we're thinking day. about uh, uh, how the business support measures introduced by the government so far are they working for you? That's our question. Are they very appropriate? Fairly appropriate, fairly inappropriate, very inappropriate, or don't you know yet? Um, open poll. Um, uh, how's it going for you? It will be interesting to, for us to see as things have moved on in a week. Uh, the poll are, is open. Uh, we'll do it for uh, 30 seconds. Um, and uh, I can see that we've got about half of you have voted. Please press your buttons now. What was that quiz show that did press your buttons now? I can't even remember what it was. <laughs> no idea, Steve. Someone could tell us. Yeah. Put it in the questions box. All Put right, <laughs> tell me when. Should we close it now? Um, yeah, five, four, three, two, one. Let's have a look. There that's we go. It's a combination of, that's probably more positive than I imagined, so that's good. Um, 46 but a half of you think it's fairly appropriate. Um, 32% don't know. Uh, hopefully that's of use to you. Uh, if there's bits of it that are particularly working well, uh, I would be interested to know uh, in the chat uh, or in feedback what's worked well. And it may be that others haven't found that route yet and um, uh, and it'll be interesting to know. So uh, if you're not sure it's working for you, we'll keep sharing what it is. And if it's working for you and you've had a good experience, it would be useful to be able to share that as well. So that's good. We move on. OK, good stuff. So a uh, quick run through the big issues this week, and there have been some super big issues, uh, which you've been following very closely and you've been talking to the media about, Steve. So let's go through those in turn. So uh, over to you on testing. So obviously the um, government's desire to, uh, to to see test, test, test as both the way through and the way out of the COVID crisis has come front and centre uh, this week. Uh, lots in the media. Um, I think probably uh, there's a couple of points for, from our perspective. So first of all, thank you to everybody who has uh, offered uh, to support in this. And I know we're getting offers of support uh, either through via the BIA or direct to the NHS or others uh, in this. And there's a big community who wants to help. Um, second, those who've been specifically able to support the, the, the hub effort, the Nightingale Labs, as the Health Secretary described them this morning, um, by the provision of, uh, of kit. Uh, thank you very much for responding uh, rapidly to the, the, the call for that. And I know uh, that that has been very, very welcome and is enabling uh, the scaling of that, that uh, backbone uh, of, of, of this. And now I think that there's also uh, quite a lot of people who are uh, interested in uh, whether there are things that they can do to help in addition to that uh, and, uh, and get on with it. So um, and we've seen overnight, um, uh, uh, yesterday afternoon, uh, um, the Health Secretary Matt Hancock come back and commit to a new target, uh, his new targets to get to 100,000 tests uh, a, a day 
by the end of this month, end of April. Maybe I think in the next slide, um, I could talk to, to some of this as well. Yeah. So um, this is to sort of uh, outline the uh, the thinking at the moment uh, from, from the government. So I think um, uh, there's five, five uh, pillars to, to the effort. Uh, the work that's being done by Public Health England and the regional NHS labs has gone up to 10,000 a day and the plan is to get to 25,000 a day by the end of April. There's commercial swab testing with a chance for forming the UK diagnostics industry as the health secretary described it yesterday. That is in a sense the work backboned by Thermo Fisher, the hub labs, the Nightingale labs as they've been described, uh, of which many of you have supported with your, your own kit. There's then an endeavour by uh, Public Health England to evaluate for effectiveness and place orders in the global market for antibody tests, but nothing is ready with there yet. And then there's a, uh, there's a specialist effort by Public Health England, Porton Down, who are doing the research surveillance um, uh, work uh, down in uh, down in Porton Down, which gives them uh, 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 antibody uh, analysis, but it's not a, not not something that's likely to be scaled and is needed for uh, disease uh, understanding. Um, so uh, the the health secretary was keen to. Uh, to seek a, a national effort of a new di national diagnostics industry uh, overnight and we are um, keen to, to, to support uh, the drive. I think it's, it's fair to say that um, without a more detailed plan it's difficult to, to, for, for many companies to know uh, how to fit in um, and, um, and we are seeking some, we are asking some questions as to how that that plan might work. Um, I know there's a lot of willingness, but um, we need that effort to be focused into uh, into meaningful activity that can really make a difference, either to support some of these strands, strand one or strands two, uh, or be focused on, on on things that can really work. So uh, I think we are uh, looking at um, questions of um, uh, whether uh, what standards might be used, if there's going to be battlefield standards, what are they? How do you plug anything capacity in with stuff coming into that lab? And crucially, how do you get the data out in a format that's easy for the NHS to use? So I think there's lots of questions still to be asked. Uh, and we are seeking rapid rapid questions uh, and answers on that uh, during the, the, the day to day. And perhaps we'll be able to provide more information on Monday. I think the other thing that sort of happened this week is we've seen the, the desire of the small ships to sail. And I'm, I'm, thank you for many of you who've come, come forward with the, the desire to help. Um, I think it's crucial with that that I mean you've seen that there was no no adoption of it by the centre in in yesterday's announcement. Uh, we've seen the Francis Crick Institute talk about themselves as a leading small ship, um, uh, and probably in the last couple of hours I'm, I'm changing my thinking on these last uh, last couple of points. I think that probably there may need to be some sort of protocol or way of doing this that plugs in effectively to uh, enable the data to be used meaningfully by the NHS, and I'm not sure whether. The, the Crick's protocol for that will be the best or somebody else's but I think we do need a cookbook and we need a process uh, to plug into and in real time I'm trying to establish if there is one of those there's no point in uh, launching a ship if it doesn't know where it's going and can't uh, can't come alongside in the flotilla and that's really where we need to get to and the final point here I think is 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 true which is I think that we're seeing some of the most effectiveness of effective um, uh, communities coming together at a local level where there are already established working relationships between universities, hospitals, the NHS uh, and companies and I think uh, I would encourage people who've got regional networks, uh, I think we've seen good examples in Dundee, I'm aware of them in the southwest as well, uh, where communities that work together can actually help each other and this can be as mundane as being able to uh, share things that are at the bottom of the freezer or perhaps uh, packs of uh, tips or things like that which are, may, may be crucial to keep uh, existing um, lines running in, in part one but this is real time we're keen to support but we need a plan uh, details so that we can really help with this and uh, I think you can see that um, AstraZeneca and GSK uh, are keen to to, to help uh, and you can get some sense as to uh, the types of efforts that they are they are they are uh, making so I think we've got some some good uh, energy here but it's um it's going to be complex but it's moving real time more on this yeah. on Monday I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, a couple of questions and comments in in the comments box on this that you know people may have resources they may have people that can help the question is you know what's the plan where do they go to as you've just said um okay good um 
in the interest of time, I think we're going to move on, but keep the questions coming in. I'll try and come back to them if I can. So uh, what else has happened this week? Well, we put out a finance report, didn't we, Steve? Yeah, I mean, in a sense, uh, the first quarter of the year has gone very well for, for UK Biotech, and we would have been delighted to get uh, some, some coverage for this. Uh, but I also want to pay uh, tribute to, to Citrix, BIA member, who've done a great deal with Lilly uh, during this week. So uh, in some senses, there are some really good things continuing to go on uh, despite COVID, and we should just make sure that there's a, a mention there. Uh, a shout out to Citrix. OK, good. And then uh, the other thing we just pulled up here is uh, a kind of a view on impacts on trials. This was some data that was pulled together in the States by a bio and biocentry, which we thought was quite interesting. Yeah, I think you can see that um, obviously we talked about clinical trials uh, last week and there's a group who've been working with the MHRA and others. But you can see it's already having quite a big, big impact, uh, both for active trials and for those starting uh, new trials. And I think um, there's some interesting elements here in which quite a lot of this is digitising in a, perhaps at a pace that we wouldn't otherwise have seen. Yeah, so let's just check with our audience what they think about that. We've got a quick poll question here, which I'm going to launch on that topic. So let's see how we compare uh, with that survey data. So let's just get this going up. Do you want to read it out while I'm doing that? Yeah, so I think this is beyond clinical trials. We're having a fairly general question here. This can be any type of business operation. To what extent has the COVID-19 situation impacted your, your ability to maintain business operations today? Has it had a critical impact, a substantial impact, a moderate impact, a limited impact, or have you managed to virtualize and it's had no impact at all because you're already a virtual organization, probably with everybody working from home. Um, it will be interesting to see. I hope that you've seen the, the BIA uh, continuing to operate for you uh, as we've virtualized in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and um, I suppose we would say we've had quite a lot of impact on our business in the sense that um, that we have a new set of uh, asks and demands and I hope we're able to support them with you. But let's have a look. Um, uh, five more seconds. Thank you for the 65% of you who have voted. Five, four, three, two, one. Let's have a look. Substantial impact on 34% of businesses represented. 29% have had a moderate impact. Critical impact on 12 and limited impact on 21 with no impact only on four. So uh, I hope that gives you a sense as to where colleagues and um, uh, and participants in our sector are. Let's keep going. OK, good. So just a quick run through the response before we turn to Jane, Steve. So uh, first up, um, you know, just a kind of a, a recap on where the efforts are. Do you want to quickly run through these five points? Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of the, the, the stuff that we've seen from the BIA and that we've had a hand in, um, and apologies if we've missed anything, but these these seem to be the buckets in which we, we're we helping uh, on the on the effort. I think we're coordinating, obviously, as I've talked about, the, 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 the move in to support the, the diagnostics uh, effort in the UK, uh, whether that be um, uh, equipment, uh, largely people have supported with equipment. There's been the offer of lab space and the offer of staff, and that needs to be linked into a plan. Um, uh, there's a great uh, vaccine development uh, community uh, happening uh, in the UK, and we've uh, linked people together into that. Um, clinical trials of repurposed products. We've seen a big move on that this week in the UK. So we obviously had the Synergen trial start uh, uh, last week. This week, it's good to see the Gilead are doing uh, trials of their remdesivir uh, drug in the UK. So that's really useful. And others are working in screening and other, um, uh, other purposes there. So again, it's great to see that. Uh, the, the last two, I suppose, uh, I'll leave to uh, yeah. Ian and Jane uh, to talk about, and I think there's been a really substantive development in those ones. I suppose the other thing that we've done is we've tried to make sure that we are linking uh, the UK scene into, uh, into global and other developments as we find them. We've made linkages with the Gates and Wellcome Trust on their uh, accelerator to do uh, COVID-19 trials, largely around repurposing. Uh, we had a great webinar yesterday. It's available on uh, on our on our channel uh, with colleagues in China, uh, so we could learn from their experience. And in a sense, they're ahead of us uh, chronologically on this. Uh, if you've got the time, I would really encourage you. Leon Wang was on that. Uh, players who uh, Tiger made uh, Christian uh, from uh, uh, Hutchinson China Medical. Uh, really, real players who've got real insight as to what's going on and how China is uh, several weeks ahead of us. Uh, so we're maintaining those connections and we're linking into other uh, networks as we find them 
and sharing uh, our networks with uh, with the with the networks we think that might be moving these things forward fastest and uh, making sure we're linked in. Okay, good stuff. And then, um, yeah, I mean, uh, digital solutions. Actually, the, the talk is moving on on this, isn't it? And I know it's something Matt Hancock, Secretary of State, is particularly keen on. Um, so we've got this app uh, that the government's talking about. Um, what's your view on that, Steve? Is this going somewhere? Well, I mean, I, I think there's a, there's a few elements in this. And if you take a step back and you think, how is healthcare moving at pace uh, in these weeks? Um, I think so, many people may have seen the King's COVID symptom tracker, which was sort of did very well on the App Store in the last couple of days. Uh, hit uh, one and a half million users very quickly. Um, there's lots of talk about um, lots of lots of uh, healthcare is digitising as business or, or, or social interactions are. And I think this is one of the things that they prob we probably won't go back to having GPs in the normal way. But I think the really interesting thing is when you look around the globe as to whether there are thoughts where you can link the diagnostic or the test with some form of app or tracker. And there is certainly heavy thinking going on in that. If you looked at NHS Essex's um, uh, uh, um, uh, blog at the weekend, or you look at uh, concerns from uh, from people about um, uh, about privacy uh, around NHS X. But I think we're seeing we've seen ideas of this happen in Poland. We're seeing ideas of this happen in Czech Republic. We can see that it's part of the solution in South Korea. Uh, and I think we need to think about this as part of uh, where healthcare is going and our sector may be. Uh, engaged in it and I think we're seeing the early early green shoots or the early early uh, pioneering in this and as we focus on our other stuff we should keep an eye on this because we are going to link up with this world. Yeah so are people going to use it Steve? Let's run a polling question and see what people on yeah. the call. For. So yeah this is a this is really a yeah uh, so if if it enabled you to come out of lockdown sooner would you use a tracking app that was linked to your COVID-19 test results? Uh, would you would you would you do it? I mean this is obviously Current thinking, I think um, uh, it's a genuine question, and maybe you haven't thought about it before, or maybe you've you've already downloaded one, or you think, yeah, I'm I use Tinder all the time, so it'd be quite straightforward for me to do one, use one that was used for public health as well. Uh, I use Waze when I, I drive the car, and there's no problem for me to have one. I'm really interested to see whether people would or wouldn't. So uh, let's uh, let's have a go. Uh, we've got uh, 75 percent votes, so five, four, three. Two, one. Let's have yeah, a look. It's a pretty clear result. Yeah, there's a. Not sure if everybody expected that one. So let's. Uh, I think that's uh, 81 percent yes, seven say no, 12 percent not sure. Interesting yeah. to see where we go next. And let's let's do the next one. Yeah. So the next one is the broader question, isn't it? So let's just get this up. Thinking about UK society overall, do you think people would probably accept the idea of a tracking app or people would probably not accept the idea of a tracking app? I.e., do you think everybody would be like you or do you think that you are an exception? Um, or you you may think, um, I don't know, uh, but we're not giving you I don't know, so you've got to go one way or the other. But I think this is likely to be a debate that we'll we'll see um, in the coming weeks and months. So yeah. how do we think? Um, just while, how do we think? while people are voting, Steve, I just got a question on the comments box here. People want to know what the base size is for these polls. Um, just so people know, there are currently 263 people dialed into the call. Uh, so that gives you an idea of the scale of the response. Not everyone's voting on every poll, of course. That gives yeah. you a sense. I mean, uh, they are non-scientific. Um, they are yeah. impressionistic. Uh, I'm afraid that's all we can do. So, right, let's shut, let's shut that one down. Yeah, share that result with you. So, two thirds to one third. Two thirds to one third. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. We will. We will. We. Will, I just think it was useful one to to pr provoke some thought. Let's keep going. All right. All right. Well, the next bit, Steve, is to hand over to Jane. I don't know whether you you dialed in. Can you hear me, Jane? I can hear you, Michael. Can you hear me? <clears throat> I certainly can. Okay. So, uh, great. Sorry, we're a bit behind time, uh, Jane. Uh, but Sorry. Jane Osborne, XBIA chair chair of Mogrify, uh, our expert leading our antibody therapy task force. Uh, oh, you're up on screen, brilliant. Hi. Um, Hi. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we're going to do this a QA and a format. Uh, and just in the interest of transparency, for everyone else on the call, I have shared these questions with Jane in advance. I don't want to leave any deb debate about that. Um, but uh, we just thought it would make it a bit more interactive. So the first question, Jane, um, just for people like me who don't really understand what it is that you're doing here, can you just give us a, a, a quick kind of 20 second version of what is an antibody therapy and how might it help treat people with COVID-19 symptoms or problems? 
Yeah, thanks, Michael. So as, as you've already explained in the introduction, there's a, a lot of effort going on into developing vaccines, which you'll hear from Ian in a minute and repurposing. Um, but I think we need as many tools as possible in the toolbox to um, help protect people and treat people. Uh, and antibodies are a way of delivering um, potentially passive prophylactic um, approaches to help protect um, the elderly and people at risk who might not respond as well to vaccination. Um, there is also the potential to bring antibodies in as, as um, early therapies in, in, the, in the course of the disease progression as well. So we're working on um, developing panels of neutralising antibodies um, and, and looking at how we can bring those into the clinic as quickly as we possibly can. Yeah, sounds good. So you, you set up this task force and how's it going so far? Um, what, you know, what progress have you made? I mean, we last spoke to you a couple of weeks ago. So uh, how have things moved since then? Yeah, so the the idea behind the the, uh, the, the task force and what we're doing is really setting up a, a, a process to sort of feed um, an assessment funnel with um, antibody um, inputs. Um, so they could come from patients, they could come from immunised mouse, they could come from literature. There's a lot of antibodies out there globally. So I don't think there's any particular um, shortage of ideas for um, uh, antibodies that can go into um, the, 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 the process. And then we're setting up a way of um, making small scale um, amounts of antibodies, um, triaging through neutralisation assays and, and moving into the clinic. Uh, and then under, underpinning that, we're developing um, innovative ways of manufacturing these at really tight timelines, which I think is something that the UK um, uh, community are bringing some great thinking to uh, and doing that in dialogue with the regulators as well. We're, we're connected into um, National Institute of Biological Standards and Control. Um, so we're, we're piecing all that together. Um, we started building this task force probably around about um, three, three weeks ago um, and we're, we're, we're putting together um, a steering committee and then we've got three um, groups working on the sort of early end of that, the antibodies and material supply, the manufacturing piece, which is linked into the vaccines and manufacturing task force as well, and then looking at the clinical and regulatory end and how we actually bring these into um, appropriate clinical settings as quickly as possible. Yeah, okay, just a question coming in from the audience here. So are, are there any useful knowledge uh, kind of points in terms of antibody therapies that we're getting in from China or South Korea? in terms of, I mean, they're a bit further ahead of us in terms of the progression of the disease, aren't they? Yeah, so we're, we're monitoring what's going on in China. There are a number of neutralizing antibodies that are um, being developed in China. There's some plasma therapies as well. So we're, we're trying to take um, a view of, you know, keeping on top of the international science um, and that's, that, that's being factored in, yeah. Yeah, okay, good. I mean, you talked about quite a lot of work there in terms of development and then rollout. I mean, where on that spectrum do you see the biggest challenge uh, being? I mean, it sounds like it's all incredibly challenging, but what are the specific yeah. problems you've seen? I, mean, I think, I think the, the, the first point to make is that the community have been amazing <clears throat> in their response to COVID. Um, and I, I should thank Steve and the BIA and everybody for their attitude. So we've been setting this up very much with a open innovation, people bringing resource and capabilities where they can, contributing where they can, and we're trying to stitch that together in an integrated process. We've got loads of offers of help from BIA members, from non-members, um, from the academic community, and as I said, interactions with um, Public Health England and um, National Institute of Biological Sciences. So um, also like LifeArc, CR UK, there's, there's plenty of offers there. So I think there's a massive opportunity and, and huge thanks to everybody. The challenges are stitching that together in a way that, that makes um, sense to sort of run this in a seamless way. Um, we're starting to put some project management um, around that uh, and we're, we're gradually populating these teams. The challenges really are understanding how we can, I mean, it's not access to antibodies per se. Um, there are plenty of um, ideas and opportunities there. It is really mapping out um, the speed to manufacture and the clinical plans. And we're, we're, we're building more of a focus now on the, on the sort of back end of this regulatory and clinical um, understanding so that we can have some clear plans of how we can go into the clinic um, and assess these therapies as, as quickly as we can. We set um, um, a very aggressive timeline on that of, of um, November um, as, a, as a target for the first wave of antibodies, first time in human. There may be a second wave in Q2 next year. Yeah, um, you know, we talked before about regulatory flexibilities. I mean, so in November to get us in Q2, 
human studies going? When might we see these things available for treating patients if they prove to be effective? Um, well, we, we'd hope to, to see that next year. Um, yeah, that, that's that's the that, that, that's the the challenge and the hope. Um, we are uh, we have had very nice offers of regular dialogue with with the UK regulators, which I think is a, a great advantage. Actually, I think it's something that um, could actually help accelerate. So having take take more of a sort of ping pong approach on on the dialogue rather than submissions and and um, uh, responsing. Yeah. Okay. Good stuff. Um, so you said a lot of people have helped already. You've got fantastic yep. offers in. But you know, what else can the life sciences community do to help you and your colleagues move this forward effectively and quickly? Um, well, I think um, what we do need to do is map out some of the capacity gaps that we've got. So I think we're, we're starting to build reasonable. Um, capabilities in that sort of early small-scale material supply. Um, Paul Varley is leading the manufacturing side and is mapping out some of the capabilities there. I think that there's going to be a need for transient, um, large-scale transient um, expression systems. Um, and then downstream, again, understanding the clinical settings. So we've got some experience of SARS and MERS um, uh, in, in the team, understanding how we can um, define dosing um, dosing is going to be key in um, effective antibody um, therapies here and understanding the need for, for lung delivery or not and how we how we actually sort of assess um, access to the lung um, capacity. So there's, there's more of a need for um, clinical expertise, particularly with experience in driving um, clinical trials in, in viral settings. OK, good stuff. Right. Just in quick fire mode, Jane, would you mind just taking a couple of questions from the audience? I mean, literally, you can do the five seconds each. Uh, for some idea of scale, how many antibodies have you sourced or generated in a triaging to date? So the first panel, we've got um, around about 12 that we're sort of taking through, which includes some control antibodies. Um, we'll probably have another panel in about two or three weeks' time from some of the mouse immunisations and patient samples. We're hoping to take forward um, you know, a panel of... Um, well, ideally, you know, if we can get up to 100, that, that would be... That would be, that would be um, excellent, uh, and then we'll triage down. We're going to need cocktails and combinations of antibodies to make this successful. So, okay, good stuff. Um, is this UK based only, or is there any kind of international collaboration going on? So, um, most of the um, offers of support so far have been from the UK community, but that we're very open to international conversations. We are talking to um, linking into finding out what's happening in, in some of the big pharma um, and China. Um, and actually some of the antibodies that are already being defined from the states, so very open to um, international collaboration. Um, but I think some UK resilience in terms of being able to manufacture is important as well. Okay, and then a very difficult one to end with. Uh, realistically, are antibody therapies or vaccines likely to come to fruition first? Um, well, I would envisage that the vaccines will come online first. Um, so, um, but I think we, we, we need to have as many tools, as I said, in our, in our toolbox. And, and, and um, I mean, I, I think a philosophy of um, redundancy at the moment is actually pretty important and, and the right way to go. If we end up having things that we can then put, put to one side, I'd much rather be in that position. Um, but Ian can give more detail on timelines for vaccines, I think. That sounds like a brilliant segue to turn to Ian. So thank you, Jane. Uh, fantastic uh, answers there. I hope that was incredibly useful for people. Uh, certainly really fascinating for me. Uh, if you've got any further follow up questions for Jane, do keep putting them in the question box and we'll give Jane a readout of those after the end of the webinar uh, and we'll get back to you on anything. Um, good. So turning to Ian then. So uh, Ian, can you hear me? Uh, yes, thanks, Michael. I can hear you. Brilliant. So, Ian, you're leading our uh, UK Vaccines Manufacturing Task Force, um, which we heard about a couple of weeks ago. So I've got questions for you as well. Um, and Good. as with Jane, if people are going to, as we're talking, want to throw things in the question box, I've got them live on my screen. So I'll try and give you some rapid fire questions as well at the end. But let's kick off with just a broad question, as I said to Jane. So you know, in a couple of weeks, where have things got to? What's the latest update from your task force? Michael, this has moved incredibly quickly. Um, so we we had a we had a webinar about maybe it was two weeks ago when we were forming the task force, and um, 
thanks to Steve for setting it up. It is important just to remind people that Steve, Steve and the BIA set this up, but perhaps more importantly, the BIA community has been fantastic. Um, way exceeded expectations and uh, of help and, and more importantly, can do attitude. So we're up and running. Uh, we're doing really quite well, actually. And maybe if I just talk a little bit about the structure of the task force that we have um, and what happens next with it. So we formed a, a task force. The, the goal is to be able to scale up manufacturing to produce a large number of doses of vaccines quickly. Uh, there's a, a secondary objective, which is how do we create the knowledge and capability to support a future UK uh, response to a pandemic should it occur. That's kind of secondary, but we, that is important. So um, we have set up our work streams principally around the two lead vaccine candidates that exist in the UK. So the adeno uh, viral vaccine from Oxford, which has basically got all the big schools in Oxford working together on this. And we have a, a manufacturing task force linked to that, led by Peter Coleman from Cobra Bio and Stephen Ward from the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult. The other main product uh, candidate is an mRNA vaccine uh, from Imperial, and uh, Dave Tudor from CPI is leading that work stream, both on the manufacture of the drug substance in the formulation, because it's quite an interesting formulation. Um, Jane talked about the antibody group, which we're closely linked to uh, and supporting from a manufacturing point of view. But whatever products come our way, they're going to need to be filled and finished. And quite often people forget a little bit about that. So we've set up a work stream that Ian Muir from Innovate UK is leading. Um, and we've also anticipated, uh, I think Steve mentioned it, but the supply chain is always difficult in these uh, types of products, but it's particularly difficult at the moment because of the situation and Steve Bagshaw from Fujifilm is leading that group. Matthew Duchar from the Vaccines Manufacturing Innovation Centre is closely involved in the task force because Matthew is going to do absolutely everything he can to pull forward the VMIC creator capability there um, in a much shorter time scale. It's probably not the answer to everything but it's certainly a big piece in the jigsaw. And last but not least, um, Pamela Tranter has been helping us with communications. And as we've got into this, the demands for communications, interestingly enough, is almost as difficult as some of the, <coughs> excuse me, some of the other work, uh, work streams. Now, it's really important just to finish off on this, uh, Michael, to say that all the way along this, Andy Jones from UKRI has been completely integrated into this process, which has been super helpful because although it's a BIA group of members in the main that's working on this, having Andy's input and connection through UKRI into government has been great. And Ian Rees from MHRA has been with us every step of the way and clearly that's going to be critical in the future. So that's the sort of structure where we've got to one other little point because it's right up to date is we are now adopted um, by Patrick Valance and a larger task force that exists and the very first meeting of that is today and we'll be reporting in on the work that we've done so far. So hopefully that gives a good view of just how far we've come in such a short space of time. And I really would like to thank all the people that I've mentioned and the ones that are behind them. Fantastic. So that does give us a good view. Unfortunately, it doesn't give us a good view of you personally, Ian, because uh, there's no webcam. I don't know whether you can flick it on for us so we can see you. Uh, oh, there we go. Brilliant. I was trying to avoid Very that, nice. but you've okay, forced you me It's all right. You talked a bit about the challenge of your supply chain. Um, I mean, is that the biggest challenge? What, what other problems do you, do you foresee coming down the track? I think, obviously, you told the, the audience that we had looked at these questions before. There isn't a single biggest challenge here. There's just multiple challenges. But mm -hmm. the, the opportunity here is, 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 is really big. So when we first started off, we didn't think we had an mRNA supply chain at all. But actually, when we've dug into it, there's capability around the UK that will enable us to do this. So there's all the technical challenges that you would expect in this. Yeah. Um, there's all the, the, the challenges of piecing together the supply chain, but I do think that it could be scarce materials. If you think about it, everybody in the world is doing what we're doing. So they're all looking for the same materials, the same stuff that we will need to do it. And I think that may turn out to be the biggest challenge that we have all together. Okay, good stuff. I mean, the other thing that struck me when I was kind of thinking about this was just how, how long and complicated the process is. So, you know, why does it take so long and can we do it faster? Just, I mean, this is the absolute banana skin question, isn't it? 
because um, whatever you say, it's, it, it, it kind of holds you a little bit to fortune. Everybody in this audience, I'm sure, will know about safety and efficacy. Um, and the whole system is set up for any medicine development to be ensure it's safe and efficacious. The timelines that we've put together, um, it's possible to condense them to some extent because the other factor that is always in these evolutionary processes is risk. So quite often they run in sequence um, and the more you run them in parallel, the more risk you take. So I think there's a financial risk associated with that uh, for people. There's also a, t a, a time risk because if you go too far down the track and find you fail, you actually lose more time than, than had you done it sequentially. We are working super close uh, with MHRA and they are, as, as usual, really, really supportive of helping to find ways to run this in parallel. I think the other thing that might become important in, in speeding this up is um, how much government support comes into this and how much we can take out elements of, of, of risk through government support. And um, I think that's to be determined, Michael. I, I have no idea how that will work out yet, but um, I know that everybody wants something available as soon as possible and people talk about exit strategies and the importance of vaccines. We will have to find something to help us with this um, as quickly as possible. Okay, good. I'm going to turn to some audience questions now. They could be pretty random, so bear with me. Uh, feel free to pass on any that you're not sure about, Ian. Um, are there multiple strains of the virus? Uh, Italy maybe had a particularly virulent strain, perhaps. Are you aware of anything on that? I don't, Michael. I, my, my expertise is very firmly in manufacturing uh, and stuff like that, and I, I wouldn't even hazard a guess to that, I'm afraid. Okay, good. How do we communicate with each of your strand leaders? Uh, does everyone go through Nessie on that, or, or we're going to give people contact details well, for each of the ones? Um, that is one of our biggest challenges, actually. So just a shout out for Nettie. She's fantastic. But even Nettie can't cope with the volume of help that's coming in, which, as you could imagine, um, must be big if Netty can't cope with it. We're trying to set up a bit of a project management process that will allow us to sift all the help that we get. So I think for now, if Netty, Netty will probably be on the call and she'll kill me later, but I think we'll have to route it through Netty. But we do need to get um, a sort of structure around that in order to manage it. And, and also I think we need a little bit of understanding from people who are offering help that it is just such a volume of stuff that um, we're struggling a little bit with it. Okay, good. Can you provide a list of materials that you need in case anyone can help? So that is exactly what Steve Backshot is working on now. So um, if you imagine how this works, the lead kind of comes from the products, the product specific work streams. And Steve, we had a call, uh, our second call yesterday. Steve is working on that. Um, so we just need a little bit of time to compile that and then it's a good point really is how we uh, reach out to people to support it. So um, work in progress. Okay, what about international collaboration? You touched on this a little bit, risk of duplication or competition uh, for scarce resources or a gridlock. So that, that is a really important point. We've reached out to CEPI to see if there's anything going on with CEPI that's trying to um, manage this in some way and uh we have that's just really we just did that yesterday so we'll have to wait and find out whether there is something on this i think it's incredibly difficult to collaborate at this stage but we've got a lot of connections um internationally and i know that bays uh, in government are thinking about how we might do that so i'm hoping that perhaps through that route we might be able to get some assistance as well Okay, good. And then a quick last one. So um, what sort of skills do you need? And is there a pressure, pressure on skills or workforce uh, in this? Yes. Um, so early days for skills, but we've already identified this as a potential, potential issue. So the supply chains that we're developing are going to be geographically spread around the UK. It's quite likely that not all of the skills we need are located in those locations. So we might need to have a little bit of a uh, transportable skill base. The other thing that is right on us now is that people are being affected by this and they're, they're having to isolate. So we're talking about how might we get these people designated as um, critical workers so that the, 
the, it, a bit like the NHS actually, not as critical, but um, how can we get them designated perhaps for early testing? Should they be isolated to see if they've had the illness and if they've recovered? So um, that will be a real issue. The deeper we get into our work, I think we'll uncover more of those people constraints. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Ian. Just turning to you quickly, Steve, this question about testing of our workforce um, came up from someone as we were going through the stuff on testing earlier. I mean, that will be a priority, won't it? I mean, if we're going to get all this done, you know, these antibody tests, if and when they're proved to be effective, uh, we'll want them for uh, the people involved in this task force work, wouldn't you say? I think the world will want them, and I think that there will be um, a limited supply to begin with. I don't think we're we're there yet, and um, I, I imagine that um, uh, that there will need to be a prioritisation process. I think we can, you know, clearly see that work to get us out the other side of COVID is uh, is central to, to that. And I would imagine that there would be a strong prioritisation of, uh, of people working in that that that, that area. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm conscious that this uh, frontline NHS staff and 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 others who are probably uh, uh, vital, um, um, and we'll see. And that's why I think. You know, number one, we need um, a, a working uh, antibody test that can be scaled, uh, and then we can worry about how we um, how we how we prioritise or allocate it. But number one, we've got to make it first. Yeah, and just picking up on that point that Ian raised about government support. I mean, there's a question here about funding. Is all of this currently voluntary? Is that sustainable? Um, where are the resources yeah. coming from? <clears throat> so I think at the moment, as you say, I mean, it's been fantastic. I mean, I pay tribute to. Ian, all of the task force leaders, Jane, all the people she's working with, people have just got on and decided to do this rather than worry about uh, essentially which hat they're wearing or where this is going. And that is fantastic. I mean, my sense, and perhaps Ian will comment on this as well, is there is willingness to uh, to support this. We've seen the adoption of some of the, the work that Ian's talked about by Patrick Balance. I believe that there will be uh, fundamental support from this. I've had uh, talks with many people across government about their, their desire to support this. I'm sort of working on the basis that um, that that will follow, and you can see we're in an extraordinary time. So uh, that there are, you know, processes in UKRI, innovate even further up government, which I think will be uh, will be supportive of this. And uh, as a very senior member of the government said to me, um, the types of money we're looking at are chicken feed compared to the amounts that are being um, thrown around to try and keep the economy going. So even if it's tens of millions or hundreds of millions of pounds, it's um, it's not um, big money compared to uh, the rest of the government support package and if it's the way out uh, even by a few weeks or, or, or builds it a capacity for the future I think it'll be supported. Okay like, brilliant stuff. It's a little bit frustrating somehow sometimes that people in circumstances like this look at only at what they need and not already at what has been provided that is really good so just just to um to outline that the supply chains that we are looking at involve facilities that the government has already invested in and had they not invested in these facilities previously we'd be in, we'd be in trouble so there's been some really good stuff we, we've requested on a very specific we've requested some funding for project management support not a huge amount but but it's significant and we've got it so so far one out of one 100 percent track record on what we've got um what we've asked for we've got we are moving and and i should say both the oxford uh, project and the mrna project is fully funded to get through the first and early st stages maybe up to about a million doses so we need to be very articulate in what we need next and how it will how it will be used and how it will deliver these uh these treatments, and I, I'm really confident that we'll get funded for it. Okay, that's a good positive note to end on. There's a lot of questions coming in here on people wanting to get in touch, which is obviously fantastic news. So I'm just going to turn to the next segment of the presentation where we just run through that, Steve. Um, so thanks, Ian. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, your web camera off if you want, uh, and let's just move the slide forward. So next section, keeping in touch and getting involved. Okay, so Steve, I'm going to turn to you on this, if that's okay. Yeah, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to keep a drumbeat that's capable for us as an organisation, as the BIA, to keep you uh, involved, engaged. And we're thinking of doing these sort of weekly, probably on Fridays, but next week's Easter, so we're going to do it on Thursday. So we're going to do another webinar next Thursday, and we're going to look at, uh, go back to the sort of 
how do you run a business during the time of COVID rather than what are we doing as a sector on COVID? So how you run a, a business during this? And we're going to focus on some of the priorities that you suggested to us last week, operations and supporting your workforce. And we'll try and get into the details on that. Um, if you'd like to get our weekly bulletin uh, that comes out on a Monday, you can register at bioindustry.org. We try and do a written update on a Monday. So CEO update, latest things. If you've got ideas and you, you know what you think would be useful for future webinars, please bung them in the question section and we're providing the latest information and updates on things we think are useful to the sector on our microsite, which uh, Michael and Adam are curating fantastically by biacovid19.org. Uh, and if you've got anything that you think you've found that's useful that you think others might want to put it up there. Um, we're also thinking about how we run um, events as we go on through the weeks and months as to what might be topics or things like that. Uh, and you can uh, input to our events team uh, there. And I think, Michael, you're also up for some suggestions. Yeah. In absolutely. terms of what the government, government is asking for from us, um, there is now a uh, Corona support from business page, uh, which is more general uh, on the gov.uk website. And uh, this is the list of things that they are asking for industry support on. Um, uh, it's got a, a form and you have to uh, fill it out. But uh, if you're thinking of offering and you've got anything in these areas, um, that is the official way that we are being asked to push people in the, uh, into support the system. So we go to the next slide. I fear we've lost Michael, so uh, I will endeavour to drive. Um, so um, we, we've put the contact points that we've been given by, um, uh, by government uh, into, uh, uh, into our microsite. Uh, the government contact points here are, uh, are varied and different, differential, and I believe that they are struggling with uh, capacity here uh, as they come in. Uh, so there's testing and diagnostic capacity uh, questions go to this PHE address, vaccines to this PHE address, ventilators to the Bayes address, and um, digital and NHS to dnhsx at nhsx.nhs.uk and there's also this uh, england.covid research at nhs.net uh, email. I think the challenge here is that the capacity for the UK government uh, to respond uh, may not be at the pace and scale that you're used to uh, and, um, uh, and, and I'd, I'd encourage you to bear with. This is a wiring problem that is uh, very challenging at the pace that we're moving. Uh, we've put some, uh, some emails down here on the right hand side uh, for, for members of the BIA team who you may want to engage with. Again, please be aware that, um, uh, that inboxes are filling up, so please don't expect uh, an instant turnaround uh, to anything, and we will probably need to evolve this as we go forward. We're having vo higher call volumes and email volumes uh, than normal, and if you can bear with to get these types of updates, um, know that they're coming and we'll do them every week. Um, if you if you don't know much about us and you want to engage more, um, we do a whole lot of other things other than, than this work. And um, Michael McGiven, who uh, helps us with, uh, uh, with growing our, our community and growing our membership, uh, will be keen to have a chat. Do please email Michael. Um, uh, we'd love to, if you found this useful and you can understand what we're doing as a, as a community, we try and make sure that our members' voices are heard and move, move things forward for the sector. We hope we connect people together in a way that's, that's useful, either in events or committees. And um, we have got a, a saving scheme for those of you who are continuing to, to work in the lab at this time. We're really keen to engage with you. And if you've not heard more from us, do please uh, do please engage further. I think that that's um, time for comments and questions. I think we've done lots of them as we go through and I'm conscious of time. So uh, we will round, we'll pick them up um, at the end and, and use them to expand our, our thinking for next time. With that, I'd like to thank you. Thank you for your engagement. I always welcome comments uh, and feedback uh, on this. I hope you found it useful. Thank you for, for attending and hopefully see you next week. I look forward to working with you on this. Many thanks and I'll end it there. Thank you. <laughs>